This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. For animal lovers, by animal lovers. Hey, Brian from Snake Bites here. I'm Corey Wall, wildlife adventurer from Australia. And we're cruising around California. Today, we're at the Reptile Avenue's retail store, Reptile Factory. You're watching Snake Bites. My name is Brian Bartrek. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week, I'll be in Southern California at Reptile Avenue, highlighting the retail outlet. You're watching Snake Bites. So Corey, I grew up basically popping into reptile stores and pet shops just like this one. So it's awesome when I can come in and just see these animals. And what I have here, of course, is a, a green iguana. These guys are endemic to Central and South America. And I know you know this animal really well. Yeah, definitely. This is uh, the type of guy I could find in my backyard in Australia just about uh, any day of the week in the summertime. The exactly. bearded dragon. Exactly. And both these guys are omnivores, actually. I mean, bearded dragons will eat vegetables and you know, obviously bugs of all sorts, even other little animals. And, and of course, green iguanas, although they're a little bit more heavily vegetarian, especially as adults, around the breeding season, they'll typically get more carnivorous and want more protein in order to breed. Now, the green iguanas are, are a really common pet, but to be totally honest with you, they're not really for everyone. They get pretty large, and unlike this animal here that's really docile, some of them can be a little bit cantankerous. As for bearded dragons, what's been your experience? Bearded dragons in general, they're just so placid, so quiet, really easy to maintain as long as you keep their temperatures right and you keep them happy and healthy and a, you know, a good variety in their diet, but they're very, very docile. This guy's really warm at the moment, so he's moving around a lot, but they're, they're small, easy to maintain, and anyone with a small apartment can look after a bearded dragon quite easily, whereas on the other hand, with this big uh, spiky beast you have here. Yeah, they need a big enclosure. I mean, these guys are, are, you know, they can get six foot long. They love to climb. I mean, a cage needs to be pretty large to keep an animal like this the right way. And again, a lot of times, they're just not really the, the best of pets. They love to whip their tail. This one is a beautiful animal. And if you get an animal that's this docile like this, it can be a great, great pet. But certainly a bearded dragon is the better choice when it comes to you know, beginner or even maybe novice keepers. Definitely starting out, yeah. I tell you what, every time I see one of these things, I get a huge smile on my face. They're one of the cutest little animals, I think. This is an African pixie frog or an African bullfrog. It's one of the largest species of frog on the planet and really the largest in captivity. And they're being commonly bred now, so you see them a lot in the pet trade. This actually is just a little pup, believe it or not. This little thing here will get as big as a dinner plate. And what I love about them is not only their cute little face, but the fact that they will eat something almost the same size as their body. These guys are little garbage disposals. I remember buying one of these guys when I was about 16 years old from a local pet shop, and I had it for about 10 years. It was just such a cool little animal. I tell you, I will always, always love these little cute faces. Look at that thing. <laughs> Have a look at this little gem. This is from the Solomon Islands. He's an emerald tree skink, and he's also found in the Philippines. Awesome little diurnal daytime skink, and what they do is they run around the trees and they hunt for any little invertebrates. They've got great eyesight, and they can pick up movement through the leaves, and they just run over and bam, hit their, hit their prey, chew it up, swallow it down. You can see he's got long toes here with good little claws for climbing. So obviously the green color there makes great camouflage for him, and, and when you're out looking for reptiles, Remember, it's not just the big things, it's these little tiny guys which count as well and great to find. Hey, so Corey, remember that time back when you uh, handed me a tarantula at the reptile show? Oh yeah, that little itty bitty hairy spider that yeah. was about that big. Well, I want to test your reptile handling skills and uh, I'll be back in like five or ten minutes. See what you can do with this snake, all right? Oh! Have fun. Look at what we got here. Okay, so this is obviously a reticulated python and it looks angry. Now these snakes grow pretty big, and this one here is just a baby. But believe it or not, they have over 60 teeth in that mouth there. They don't have fangs for injecting venom, but they've got a lot of teeth. And when they bite you, they make you bleed a lot. So I don't know what Brian wants me to do with this snake. Maybe he was hoping for another outcome, but I might just try and slip it back in here. 
and say, see you later. I found a little friend for you, buddy. Something you might like to have a look at. Another arachnid. Do I have to do this? Um, I don't know. Does he have to do it? I think he does. So this is a Plamina nurses. Okay, this wait, is wait. a tight scorpion. Tell me exactly what you want me to do because I'm shaking right now. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is get you to just hold your hand out flat like that. Tuck can your I, thumb can in. Can I close my eyes or do I have to keep my eyes up? Tuck my thumb in. Okay. Yeah, tuck your thumb in so there's no gaps. There we go. Um, you can close your eyes if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, I, I, I try to love all animals. I really do and all, even bugs, but I, 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 I have an issue with I'm definitely afraid of, everyone knows that I'm afraid of arachnids in particular. So uh -huh. This is the first scorpion I've ever held in my entire life. So wow, faith, that's awesome. Faith is in with you. Okay. Awesome. Right, awesome. Do, do, do you trust me? Put the damn scorpion <laughs> on my hand. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, it's healthy for you to get over your fears and, you know, to get handed a scorpion by someone instead of finding one in the wild and having to deal with and it. And it's not, it can't sting me like this. It, it can, but I'll tell you about it later when it's on your hand. <laughs> okay, guys, I, listen. So bad. Listen, uh, I always talk about people with fear of snakes and how they need to get over their fear of snakes. Um, so I'm always willing to do this type of stuff because I have to conquer my fears because how can you believe in me about getting over your fear of snakes if I don't get over my fear of bugs and tarantulas and, and arachnids? And t Tell me something about it so I can get my mind off it sitting in my hand. <laughs> All right. Well, they, they are. They're a really cool arachnid and obviously they're found on just about every continent and all different types. There's, there's model tree scorpions which live in trees under bark. There's desert scorpions which obviously live in, live in the desert in the hot, arid climates and they, they dig holes in the desert and they're nocturnal where it's too hot. And this particular guy is a rainforest scorpion from Southeast Asia. And uh, he will actually come out and actively hunt at night. And any large arachnids that he can grab or uh, insects that he can catch grab and overpower, he'll eat those as well, including things like small little slug snakes or, or worms or any other type of um, arthropod. In, in this, what, what kind of stinger? I mean, is it, is it the bigger the scorpion, the less? Uh, that's what I've always heard. Smaller scorpions are worse? Yeah, the, the, the general rule of thumb with the scorpions is if he has a big, thick tail and little slim pincers, he needs to have the potent venom because his slim pincers aren't really strong enough to overpower his prey. So he, relies on that potent venom and once again like all arachnids they inject venom they all have venom and that actually starts the decomposition of their prey before they start eating it. And, and this guy seems to be upset because he's got his pincher ready to kill me. Uh-huh. No he's not too oh bad at gosh. all. Another interesting thing with these guys too is you see he's got his pincers here the main two ones if you have a look right in between there he's got another set right there. See the little tiny ones? Yeah, they're little And tiny. they come out one at a time and they pull apart his prey as well. So there it is, guys. The first scorpion I've ever handled. I think I did it pretty much like a pro. You nailed it, buddy. Good job, <laughs> good job. Minus the whining and crying. It's actually a really cool little bug. They are, they are, they are. And then actually the first time you see one of these under a black light, you'll fall in love with them because they just glow iridescent. Yeah, what's not to love? All right, guys, I absolutely love blood pythons and short tail pythons, and I'm in for a treat right now because these are some beautiful animals right here. This happens to be a T positive. Whew, it's a little sketchy. This is a, a T positive albino blood, which is, <laughs> whew, these guys sometimes can be a handful. But look at that beautiful snake right there. Again, that's a recessive mutation. And that is gorgeous. And the T positive part means that it still has some tyrosine, which is a type of melanism that just gives it a more purpley look, which is really beautiful. But take a look at its, its cage mate here. Ooh, I'm gonna do this without trying to get bit because sometimes these guys can get a little bit raily. And I tell you what, I've been bit by blood pythons this size before. It's not a fun sight. Ooh, get back in there. Woo! All right, good. All right, so. This happens to be what they call a cherry bomb T positive, which is basically just a lime bread trait to get more red in it. Now look at the difference of that animal. <laughs> These guys are a little bit squirmy. Uh, some blood pythons can really tame down. And again, these guys aren't mean whatsoever, but they definitely <laughs> like to move around weird. But look at how gorgeous this cherry bomb is. 
blood pythons are just such an unusual animal because they're so fat and they've got that really cool looking head. And again, they have a lot of power behind them. Now, these aren't exactly blood pythons, although in the past they were kind of known as black blood pythons. Now they're really short tail pythons, which are pretty similar, obviously, looking than a blood python, but they stay a little bit smaller, and of course, it's that little short tail that gives them their namesake. You can see this one here has that black head, which is really cool, but take a look at this one here. This one is also a black short tail, but look at the difference in the head. I mean, that is one really cool looking animal. And again, these guys will stay a little bit smaller than the Malaysian red blood pythons, but they're still pretty much almost the same animal. Now, now this guy looks a little bit fiery. It's kind of interesting because you could just see his eyes kind of following me right now. And he's giving that attitude like, hey, I may take a pop at you but he's pretty cool. This happens to be an ivory blood python. Now this is a super version of this snake right here, which is called a matrix blood python. And again, the matrix came in a while ago and it proved out to be co-dominant. And when you breed these two together, you're gonna get on average 50% ivories and 50% matrix, which is really cool. And again, these are the blood pythons here. And they're probably mid-sized blood pythons right now. You can see, I told you, he was gonna take a pop at me, right? Whew, you gotta watch out. These guys are lightning quick and they pack a punch like you cannot believe. You better just close this thing before I get hit for sure. But take a look at this animal here. This is a, whoo, she's, she's a mad one right here. Come on, girl, calm down, calm down. This is a big, big blood python. Whew. Just look at the size of that blood python right there. And look at how red and beautiful it is. Wow, that's blood pythons. Those are one cool, cool, cool animal. Whew, I got away without getting, uh, without getting bit. Oh, I almost spoke too soon, didn't I? <sighs> this is definitely not for the faint of heart. Whew, come on, come on, calm down, you're fine. Uh, Get her back in the cage. Whew, now that was really cool. So Corey, I know that you deal mainly with stuff that you're catching in the wild with your adventures traveling all over the world, but I wanna bring you into my world a little bit, which is these incredible paint jobs Sounds that great. we work with. Check wow. that girl out. Oh my gosh, what did you do? Did you take this out the back and hit it with a spray pack? It's, it's uh, funny you canary say Canary yellow and a bit of white. That's what, it's funny you say that. We call these paint jobs because that's what we're trying to do. We're combining a little of this, a little of that to make the coolest canvas on that snake. This happens to be a boa constrictor, but it's a snow boa constrictor, which basically just means it's two mutations, both albino and aneurythristic. So it takes a while to get something like this, but uh, together it's really super cool, huh? That's an amazing snake. Have a look at it. It's just... And it, but for something like this, which they throw maybe one every 20,000 or so in the wild, the chances of it actually surviving would be pretty much zero, right? Well, the albino certainly, you know, when you take away the camouflage, you know, you're going to have a lot more predation and stuff like that. And then, of course, this is a designer in captivity, so this was an albino that originated in the wild many, many years ago, and then of course an aneurysmic that also originated in the wild, and then in captivity, we bred them together to produce double heterozygous, and then ultimately one in 16 to produce the snow boa constrictor. But uh, but I'm not done yet. We gotta get this back in this cage because wow, there's all awesome. kinds of cool paint jobs. Now I'm gonna show you nothing but boa constrictors here, but I wanna give you an idea of the difference in what we call polymorphism within the animals themselves. Cool, cool. Take a look at this. We Now that last animal was wow. albino, and aneurysmic. This is a different type albino. This is uh -huh. what they call a T positive albino. So it doesn't have the red eyes, it doesn't have that orange red look to it, but it still is lacking a lot of the, the melanin, giving it that kind of purpley hue. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. And of course, the, the, the tail part of this snake's almost almost similar to what it would be in the wild. Yeah, it is. Again, it's just stripping like one layer of melanin, not, not all of the melanin. 
Uh, again, there's different proteins within melanin, and in this case, there's still the, the tyrosinase is still within the, the, the animal itself, giving it that kind of purpley, chocolatey look. That, but that's a beautiful, beautiful snake. The T-positives haven't been around very long, and uh, my gosh, they are absolutely gorgeous animals, huh? All right, so getting back to the albino, or really what they, they would call an amelanistic boa constrictor, this wow. is basically what it is here. Now this is lacking awesome. all of the melanin, unlike the T-positive that was only lacking part of the melanin. But this is a little more special animal than that too. It's what they call a coral albino. So you see that beautiful red on it? That's actually selectively bred, or what they call polygenics, which basically just means that you're breeding the coolest red animal to the coolest red animal, so that you get just a beautiful example of an albino. Wow, that's awesome. Have a look at its head. It looks like sherbet. <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. And again, that's just selectively bred over generations to produce that beautiful modeling of red throughout the body. So how many generations do you think this would take? Well, it's probably at least two or three generations of red, and it could even be three or four generations of red to get that beautiful animal. And every time you continue to breed that to a more pink animal, you're going to continue to get better and better offspring. Wow, that's amazing. I wish we could have these guys in Australia. It's such a beautiful snake. It really is. Well, I know that you're more of a guy that is out there in the wild, in the bush, finding locality stuff. Well, let me show you a couple of those guys. Awesome. But now I want to get into kind of the more locality animal. Something that if you were, you know, cruising around northern Peru, yeah. like you would probably love to do, you'd find a boa constrictor like this, which is uh, what they call a longicauda. And again, you can see that's a very different looking snake than Definitely. the other snakes. And again, this is a pure locality animal. Right, right. So this is exactly what you would find in the wild in certain locations in South America. Exactly. And it's got all of that beautiful camouflage colors which enable it to sit in the ambush position waiting for its prey. No, you're absolutely right. And and, uh, and this one's it's still a pretty small animal. It's going to get quite a bit larger. And that's the interesting thing about boa constrictors is the different sizes. You know, you have some of the true red tails can get really large. The common Colombians, which most of the paint jobs are, get, you know, maybe anywhere from 7 to 10 foot. And then let me put this guy back really quick cool. and show you another locality animal that is very different size-wise. And that would be the Sonorans here. Take a look at this. This happens to be Whoa. an adult female Sonoran. This is as big as they get right here. So a lot of the Central American animals are actually quite a bit smaller than the South American animals. But that's a pure, again, locality Sonoran boa constrictor. Wow. So this is what you got to look for when you're trudging through the jungle down there herping. And you've got to spot that in a tree. That contrasts against like, you know, all the leaves and the bark would be almost impossible to see. Absolutely. Well, I know you're always going to be a wild guy. Getting out in the bush is where you live, but I'm trying my hardest to convert you over to a little bit of my world and these beautiful paint jobs that are in captivity. Well, at the end of the day, they're all beautiful creatures and, uh, you know, we have a passion for them, whether they're our pets or whether they're out in the wild. And it's all about you know, teaching people about them and they're not really that bad. They're, they, they're really nice and they don't deserve the reputation that they have. Absolutely. Gorgeous animals. <laughs> have a look at this beauty. This is a leucistic Texas rat snake, or as I like to call them, the Texas stink snake. Now what this guy does actually excretes a musk and it's part of his defense mechanism. And I'll tell you what, woo, she's a bit on the nose. Another one of their snakes defense mechanisms also is to rattle his tail really fast in the leaves, mimicking a rattlesnake and hissing and letting predators know I'm here, I, I'm making out I'm venomous, but I'm not really, so keep out of my way. He's a diurnal daytime snake, he's got big round pupils and they hunt mice, they're a very fast snake and he uses that tongue to track down his rodents. But to see just a nice white snake like this is, is absolutely beautiful. So I'm just chilling here with my new buddy Chico, the black and white Argentine tegu. I tell you, tegus in particular from Argentina are amazing animals. They're super easy to care for. They typically eat mainly carnivorous type stuff. They'll eat dog food, some eggs, typical things like that. They can 
totally be insanely cool pets. As you can see, my boy Chico here. It's a big lizard, so it's sizable enough that makes it super cool, but not so big that it's gonna eat your family dog or anything like that. But hey guys, it's been a great time just traveling around with my buddy Corey, checking this place out, seeing a pet shop for what it really is, a really cool experience for kids that come in and really experience their first reptiles and start to get the passion for it. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I have. So there it is. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Corey, thanks for coming and hanging out with me, man. Anytime, buddy. Thanks for showing us some cool animals. Well, you know, minus the scorpion, of course. But as always, I was Facebooking and tweaking my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at Snake Bites TV. Till next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Hi, I'm Peter Birch, an Aussie bloke who loves wildlife. My respect for nature started when I was a young boy in rural New South Wales. Since then, it's exploded into an obsession. New episodes only on Animal Bites TV.